Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Hannah Cha, who is actually an illustrator. Um, Hannah, with readers unfamiliar with your work, could you describe what it is that you do? I am a um, writer and illustrator, but I like to say I'm a storyteller because really I just love creating any source of story without any bounds of medium. But right now I'm residing in publishing, especially doing children's books right now. Oh, yes, you are a writer. You did write um, a book. And what, what was the name of that that you actually oh, wrote? It's a, it's a long title. It's Tiny Feet Between the Mountains. Yes. And it's a children's book inspired by Korean fables that I read while I was growing up. So that was my first debut. And after that, I've been illustrating a lot. Of, of children's books. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. So what, what draws you to writing children's books, uh, to, to actually uh, illustrating the children's books? Uh, I mean, in a way to answer both questions, I think there's something so poetic and condensed with children's books. Um, it's a balance between text and art, and it cannot exist without one another. And there's something so... I don't know if that's the right word, but visceral, where I remember reading all the children's book I when I was younger, and I tried to match the textures and everything. It was just such a good experience about stories and fiction when I was younger. And I think that's what draws me into children's books, to just maybe hopefully recreate that experience I had when I was a young kid to the younger mm -hmm. generations. And also illustration does kind of tend to lend itself more to children's books. Um, because mm. regular books don't don't really have too many illustrations, except for the it's covers. Mm. I yeah. wish there was more illustration, but I think it's because it's just so layered. Like adults' books just have so much more content that it will probably never end. It'll be books like this thick. So <laughs> it'll be more expensive too with all the printings and such. And do, do you think that... Um, that readers are sometimes drawn to the books by their cover? Oh, yeah, definitely. I know we all know the idiom, like you shouldn't judge a book by a cover, but you can't help but reach for a book that resonates with you first. But of course, it's the content inside that makes you stay. So it's kind of like the, I think, I like to see it as the welcome mat. So if it's a really nice welcome mat, you want to like, you're curious to even open the door. Mm -hmm. Now, do you do book covers as well as as the illustrations inside for um the picture books of course I do the covers but that's my next goal is to try and like open a door towards middle grades and those that world but it seems like very different and yeah I'm very curious about that I'm gearing towards it <laughs> oh excellent so what is the last thing that you worked on the last thing I worked on was um, the book House Before Falling Into the Sea, and it is written by Anne Suk Wong. It's actually coming out um, this March. Um, I'm trying to remember, March 12th, so very soon. And it's about um, the Korean War and following a child named Kyung. And it's about her parents opening their house open to the refugees during the Korean War and is in the perspective of the child trying to understand why and what is happening during that chaos, but also finding hope. And yeah, do <laughs> I'm you very excited a, for that one. Do you have it with you that you can show us? Uh, the book isn't, um, I haven't got the proofs yet, but I have oh, some okay. original paintings that I actually have done for this book. I actually went full traditional. Oh, this is one excellent. of the scenes. They're all watercolors with inks. I really like using Sumi ink. And this is another one where it's Kyung and the girl that was a refuge talking about her experiences and lamenting about what she left behind. But the one thing that this book is very dear to me is that this is actually based on the author's um, grandparents who opened up their house to the refugees. But my grandma actually was not directly refugees to their house, but she was one of the refugees from North that went to South, to Busan. 
So there was like this very interesting connection where the author is talking about the person who's accepting and opening up their homes. And I was able to talk to my grandma and talk about her experience of being the refuge going down to um, the South. So I was able to connect to my grandma more and just talk with the author a little bit more. This, the synergy was crazy. <laughs> Wow. So you, I, you, did you get a chance to really talk to the author? Not too much, but I was able to, because her manuscript was full of details about everything that happened. And I got to even see some pictures of her mom, who is actually the main girl, kind of like based off her is the main girl character, Kyung, and her grandparents are the father and mother of the book. So I was able to get some of her um, history and learn a bit, but she made sure to keep it as open as possible so I can put my story and my um, visual elements to it. So yeah, I just never knew I could make such a book in a way. <laughs> Did you have to do a lot of research yourself to, uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> to, to, get the, uh, to get the pictures? I definitely as like a person who is the third generation, we don't know the war. We only heard about it. I honestly created like an opportunity to connect with my grandma and talk to her more. It was a little bit, of course, difficult for her to bring up some of those memories of it. But with the story she told me, I was able to get good hints and like look up a lot of documentaries and imageries of Korean War to make sure I can um ah uh, sorry <laughs> I can get um the perfect picture and make it as accurately historically wow okay and um what's your favorite media to work with you said it was those uh was it watercolors oh man it's hard I right now the medium that I'm most comfortable with is I really love working with sumi ink first so I'll do black and whites um, I'll scan it in and then I'll color it digitally. But recently, the most recent book that I've done is just full watercolor because I wanted to see if I could just do it traditionally. And it worked out. So I'm like, okay, I should open up to more medium. I really like mixed medium and try to keep myself as fluid as possible. I'm the person who like prints out, draws on top of it, scan it digitally, draw on top of it, print it out again. So it's like a weird mix of digital and physical media. That's interesting. Um, and so what were the steps that you took to create the book itself? For, for this one, I... For me, it takes so much longer to sketch because I wanted to make sure that I don't need to figure out maybe the poses of the people or making sure there's nothing more um, sad where you finally finish a painting and you realize, oh, the clothing is not accurate. So you need to fix them all over again. So I found it, even though it's a little bit tedious and takes longer to like make sure you do all the research and sketch it out. But, but my happy place is really doing the painting like I can have music on or like some shows and I'm just like yes I'm just painting and I'm just in that zone wow okay <laughs> um so what was the big biggest challenge that you had in uh in creating your your book biggest challenge I've I think I always find the researching to be the most hardest part of everything because I'm trying to let go of this part of me. The perfectionist side can be a very dangerous double-edged sword where you won't be able to let go or even start anything. So I think that's the hardest part of knowing when to decide, okay, this is good enough. I should start getting into the finals because there's always, there's always going to be a small thing you can fix or add. But then if you keep on adding, then you're just looking at this I spy book of like, okay, where do I focus on? <laughs> so making sure having all the right like breaths, like where the audience can like breathe and look at the piece without being too overwhelmed, finding that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I do want to bring up that you are a Caldecott honor uh, <laughs> recipient. 
mm -hmm. um, for for the book that you um, that you illustrated mm -hmm. in 2023 um, mm -hmm. called The Truth About Dragons. And do you have that with you so that you can show? Yes. So I have the book here and I love this sparkling <laughs> embossing <laughs> of the title. I remember I like squealed when I first saw it. Um, I actually also have some original inks I have of it. But one fun thing that I actually seen some um, um, booksellers commented about is um, I made sure. So on the bottom, you see this red. And on the top is the blue. Yeah. So if you open the jacket, it's the red dragon and the blue dragon. So they real when I ever I get like emails being like, oh, I saw what you did on the top part is the blue spine and the red is the bottom part is the red. I was like, yes, you get it. I did it on purpose for the dragons. That's me <laughs> getting ahead of myself with the creating of the books because you can always hide little details. But let's see. Can, can you explain uh, a little bit more about that book? Oh, yes. So Truths About Dragons is about um, Bao Bei mm -hmm. and... Um, it's about a mom telling this story about to this multicultural child of like you have two um, dragons and two forests and two grandmas within you and you're just following this story that this mom is retelling to the child and my job was to make sure the illustration gives that story justice of like falling Balbe into these two mythical stories so it's focusing one on the eastern dragon and which is the blue dragon and the western dragon is the red wyvern like um dragon very similar to smog from lord of the rings in a way <laughs> very inspired by those like high type fantasies and then the blue, blue dragon is definitely inspired by a lot of um eastern calligraphy drawings of like the very like benevolent sea dragon that i saw growing up and speaking of the red dragon some um original inks would be here for this one I did black and white inks first and colored it digitally um this one actually you can see I messed up a lot while doing this so with tracing paper I'll redraw some faces or some elements of the um el illustration I didn't like and I'll scan it in and digitally kind of like collage it into it and then I'll digitally draw. So I try to keep this flexible as much as possible also. Um, but I try to keep to keep the traditional elements. I try and do more the base stage with um brushes and inks. Wow. That that's pen and ink, is it? Is yes. You say? Act the fun part is for the Western dragon or the Western um scene it's very, you can see the very scratchy elements of things. So this is pen nib. And then for the Eastern dragon, I wonder if I have it, or the Eastern atmosphere, I used only the calligraphy brush. So they're very softer in this elements. So yeah, I try to differentiate using different materials for different cultures. And I think some people notice it or some people, but I didn't want to make it too jarring, of course, too. So I think I found that balance because there are some people who would notice it. Some people still find it very like fluid and flows with the story. So I think that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, now, do you, do you do artwork aside from the, the uh, work that you do for the book? That is a ongoing <laughs> I feel like when you interview artists you can see some artists who just loves to draw all the time or I'm more like a spurt artist but I really want to try and do more art personally for myself back in but because I put so much research and energy into one project what happens is I'll just like spurt and I'll just do so much art and when I'm resting between books, I'm just like not doing anything and just lying back, reading a book. <laughs> so it's kind of like I'm not a marathon artist, but I, I do want to become one one day. So I think that comes with discipline and practice. So basically spurt artist, though. <laughs> so how long does it take you to actually create a book? 
I mean, to, mm. to do the artwork and have it mm -hmm. all done. Uh, I haven't really calculated per se, but I think I would say average six months. But I, my first book, I actually done it in four months. It's the writing that took the longest. So when I, like I said, because I'm a spurt artist, when it comes to painting, that almost finished almost instantly, but it's the planning that takes me the longest to make sure I won't have any hurdles in the middle of painting that, because those I think lengthen the time of like finishing the art pieces, those little bumps and like ja almost like jagged rocks along the way. <laughs> so, but you, when you were writing the story and illustrating it was that a lot easier than trying to illustrate somebody else's writing oh I think I actually think it's easier to illustrate a manuscript because there is a or I think this is also very personal I like the um borders it creates or rules it creates so my brain instantly are trying to think outside of the box but when you're writing and illustrating you are the box so it's almost like you're it's almost like an unsolvable ironic situation where you're like, I can outdo the writing, but I'm the writer. So <laughs> if the writer wants to outdo the illustrator, but then that is finding that balance is hard. So I really am so whenever I see really incredible writer and illustrators, I'm just like, I want to be like you. I need to study more, but I'll get there one day. <laughs> Still not quite used to it yet. <laughs> Okay. Um, so what else can we expect from you in the near future? I actually, so there, like I said, is the house before falling into the sea. Um, that's coming out this March. So excited for that one. And the other one is coming out at um, 2025 in the fall by um, Adib Koram. And it's called Tea is Love. And it's a picture book about following different cultures and narrative stories around tea. And I'm also excited for that, of course, because I love drinking tea and the fact that I can just illustrate so many different cultures that spans during the different times. So right now working on that one. So yes. <laughs> so it, it seems like the books that you are illustrating um, have, most of them seem to have a, an Asian type of character. Is, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. Yes, so far. I am hoping, though, to um, branch out of it, but it is definitely my comfort zone. So it's a, like my li nice um, box that I like. But of course, I need to open and venture forward further than that, too. Okay, so that that is what you prefer. That, that's your comfort zone. So you, you prefer to do that right now? Is or, that, or, or is like... that what you've been given? what been given so far but I actually did have a book called Circle Round which was a little bit more modern and is a more diverse um, array of children of all sizes just having fun one by one um, counting to 10 with circles so I can do it but I do feel like I am comfortable and do a really good job with portraying my culture or that like aspect of um, eastern um, art so yes, I but I want to just keep on honestly, just no limits. I just want to illustrate anything I can get my hands on. Any story, like I said, I'm a storyteller. So any story or little hints of like, thing, anything I can illustrate. <laughs> okay. How did, how did you become an illustrator? What made you decide that that's what you wanted to do? Oh man, um, I think it's, I actually wanted to be a writer first when I was a child, but every time I got my essays back, they were like, this is too long. You need to be more concise. And it was very hard until I met art because a picture is worth a thousand words. So I was able to actually create stories within the pictures and actually put everything I wanted to put in and not get have people lost in it. So I think that's where I found my sweet spot and just kept on doing illustration and art. But I really started late where I really pivoted during high school, junior, sophomore year to go to art school suddenly. And but somehow I got really lucky, went into an art school that I really wanted to, met really great friends and teachers that like 
gave me the foundation, more foundation that I could ever ask for. And now I'm here with just all this connecting dots. And now I'm a children's book writer and illustrator. So I think I found the perfect balance between both world, worlds. Wonderful. Okay, now I have questions about being an artist. Um, what is your favorite part about being an artist? And uh, basically about being an artist. My favorite part of being an artist is that no matter, after I have my finished art, and if I show it to people, no matter how short of a time or long of the time that someone has with it, it can make an impression to them. So I think that's really something so magical because one thing I also, for example, envy for musicians is that people can like, they can do the art on the spot and people can listen to it versus I heard musicians say, but you can have the finished piece and show it to people. Like you don't need to prepare to get into the act of the art. So it's very interesting. Just um, it might take a long time to create the art piece to show, but it will be there to make an impression no matter, no matter how short or long it is. Uh huh. Very true. What about being an artist for publication? What's your favorite part about that? I think it's, I know, of course, I never knew until, until I got into it, but just how much people are passionate about it. And that is such a collaboration. I love that they respect the spaces of the writer and the artist. So to make sure both voices can have this space to be heard in the same time without like it crossing too many boundaries or stepping each other's toes. I think it's so hard to find that balance and publishing is very patient of finding it. It was also um, because you read a children's book, it feels shorter and simpler. You think it'll be faster to create one, but I feel like it takes a more arduous process because the art and the writing is just so heavy on both sides. So that was surprising too, how long it takes to actually make a single children's book. But yeah, I that's what I love about being a artist in publishing. Like I can be mm -hmm. part of that process, make memories for children. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So what has been your favorite adventure during your career? Wow. <laughs> oh man. Oh. I mean, I honestly think it's every project, no matter how well you think you're prepared for it or every project is new. So I'll be able to explore different mediums, different directions, different type of storytelling. So every time it feels new, but also at the same time that can be daunting <laughs> because you think, <laughs> okay, this is my third book. I can totally get this. But then you're like, this is a new problem. This is a new thing to look and solve. But that is also why I became an artist because I love problem solving visually. Ah, yeah, I, I can see where there would be lots of problems to solve. Yeah. <laughs> so how do I fit this many characters while making the text visible? Or like, how do I layer this while making it very like um empty, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just fun. I like problem solving. I feel like that's what this industry is about too. <laughs> true, very true, yeah. Okay, and what is the greatest lesson that you've learned during your career? I think it's to just keep going and consider it as a marathon because, of course, like I never imagined to get a Caldecott honor or a PA <laughs> award. And of course, that's kind of like a very shiny, like sparkly star that I can put next to my career. But I knew that if that was the goal, I wouldn't be able to come this far because of course it's just, I just enjoyed the process of doing it without, and the fact that I can have little like notes from children being like, I really like this part of the book or I love this um character is, that is honestly what drives me forward. If I can make any impression to a little one, like how I imagine myself reading a children's book, that all it matters to me. And yeah, and 
getting recognition and finding new friends along the way, like new authors or new editors, designers, even you, <laughs> like with this interview. <laughs> like that's just so that's what I love. I love the journey of the journey. I think I cheated with that question in a way. Um, <laughs> I just like the journey of going forward and hopefully just expecting just new connections, a little like glitters along the way. Okay. So what piece of advice would you want to share with other artists or illustrators? Hmm. I think when I was younger or like when I just got out of college, I was very dismayed thinking I didn't have a style. But what I finally understood now is like what you find in interesting and what you want to embed into your artwork is more important than having a style. And that way you can always go forward and have something to look forward to when you do art. Because once you think you perfected a style, then I think that's there's like some emptiness to it sometimes mm. because you can't go forward or get better. But it's always that balance too, because if you always think you're not good, then there's no reward to it. So it's finding that balance of like having that carrot in front of you, but not making it too far where you're like, okay, I'm not going to go. It's not worth it. <laughs> so you need to motivate yourself. It needs to be a personal reason, not a... um not something that's beyond you or something you cannot control. But once you've actually created that style, wouldn't you want to want wouldn't you want to create a new one? Exactly. I I hope that's the case and I think that is what it is, but I think in art school especially um a lot of people that's what I just remember everyone like very obsessing over like I want a style that embeds what's me, but I wonder if it just comes with young age you want to define yourself so fast. Yeah. You don't have the experience yet to just say who you are. Now I have a little bit like with being out of school and I have more experiences beyond being an artist. I can now say like beyond art, this is also me. But I feel like in school or when you're like so focused of being artist, like you can tra be trapped with the art defining yourself as a person. So having that balance and distance away from it, I think also makes your art better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that you'd recommend to other uh, illustrators or artists that have helped you in your career? Um, I think at the beginning, I really loved SCBWIs. Um, they had a lot of um, pamphlets and a lot of beginner guides for artists because publishing ha can be very kind of like a glass door. You don't know where the door starts or end. You don't know how you get in. Um but once you're beyond that door, I think having a personal critique group or a writer's group that with people that you really resonate. I, For me, I like smaller groups because that means I can be a little bit more honest or also make sure I get enough feedback. So I have um, a author, writer, or writer, illustrator critique group like with three people, and Maya Tesukawa and um, Jack Wong. And we kind of just talk about our art and storytelling, but often it just ends up being like how much we love books. So <laughs> also keeping it just like fun, <laughs> not too serious too, because I think artists and writers tend to be already hard on themselves too. So <laughs> does that mean cheerlead squad? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> now you were telling me something before the interview actually mm -hmm. about um when you found out about your uh, award um can you can you this tell was, the little story this is real honestly it'll be something i'll remember forever and it's really beautiful because um what i didn't know was my agent and the editor kate farrell um they were they knew I was out of town because I, I was getting married in Korea and they knew I was coming back, but wasn't sure when. So my agent was like, oh, I wanted to send you a little present. When should I send it to you? And that's how she got the date of when I'm coming back from my wedding. And on that day when it came back, my editor sends me a text being like, oh, you're going to get a call be on the ready and I was like what is this what's happening I just came back I'm jet lagged <laughs> and then I get the call for the APLA award in the morning afternoon 
and I'm just celebrating and like, oh, this is happening. And then later the jet lag is kicking in, it's nighttime. I get another text. I was like, what do you mean? I'm going to get another call. And that's when I got the call for the Caldecott Award around 9 p.m. Um, and I was just, is this real? Is it true? And my cat was running around in circles because the adrenaline that started kicked in, like because everything was quiet before. I was like sleepy. I was almost about to fall asleep and not able to accept the call. So it was just crazy. And I'm just very thankful to my editor and agent who like coordinated to make this extra special of like a celebration and coming back to more celebrations for Truths About Dragons. <laughs> so it's now like sheared into my like core memory of that experience. <laughs> Always be grateful. This, like I could this, wow. this was for the truth about dragons. Yes, yeah. it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So all right. And the next question about you as a person. Mm -hmm. Um, what is one thing that most people don't realize about you? Uh, hmm. I honestly think I put my heart on the sleeve, so I feel like they already can guess what type of person I am. But I think is could be I can be more intense than they think. <laughs> and I really like celebrating. So it could be like, oh, I got like I got this little like toy I always wanted. Then I'd be like, yes, we're celebrating. Let's get something and we do something with you. So I am known to be a little bit of like a cheerleader and a celebrator. But then the opposite is I don't celebrate for myself. So my friends are like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit intenser than you think, a little bit more nervous than you think, but probably means well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, celebrate for yourself. Got that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is or are your passions when you're not working? And how do you make time to do the things that you love? Hmm. I think my passions would be, I love cooking. And that's easy because you always need to eat every day. So you got to make time for that. But of course, cooking is a little bit hard sometimes. So I try to make like, um, the weekends, I try to cook a little bit more extensive meals, especially like Korean food that I enjoy. Um, but passion wise, I love stories, but that also means like I love movies, I love shows, I love games, like all sorts of storytelling. So for that, I try and like enjoy it with my husband, who also is a huge um they're a comic book artist, actually. So we have two different, we're pu in publishing, but we're in two different directions in that aspect. So we can always just talk and enjoy storytelling. I guess it's because I can, I find time because I find it in every nook and cranny I can like shove it into. I'd be like, oh, I have some downtime. I'll read a quick book <laughs> or some downtime here. I'll do a little doodle. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. So what does your studio space look like? And what do you need to have around you when you're when you're doing your artwork? Mm, I definitely always need my I really like starting with pencil and paper. So I always need to have that around. And actually, this space is my studio, which is actually a very small nook. My hands can touch here to here. It's a space that we created in the living room and we made these like bookshelves as makeshift walls. But mm -hmm. also that answers the, the question where I always need my books next to me. So if I need inspiration, I'll just like go over to the other side, pick some more. The more important ones, I'll like pick up their more, more accessible areas. And yeah, my books and my materials. My materials are on like these nooks on the bottom too. So everything needs to be at hand's reach distance because I can get a little bit lazy. I'll be like, oh, I can't reach the paints. I'll do it later. Now I can't make that excuse if I can like reach it all the time. <laughs> okay. Now, do you um do you need to have any food or drink with you when you're I'm trying working? to get out the habit of having snacks, but definitely when I'm brainstorming, I find myself really needing sugar to like think more, or that's my excuse, but I definitely always need um, coffee or tea. So I always have my thermostat with me um, until like mid afternoon and I try and like 
stopped drinking too much <laughs> the past 12. <laughs> but definitely in the morning, you always see me with my yellow or my green thermostat. Okay. That sounds good. Um, now, when you're working, do you prefer music or silence? And if it's music, what kind? Um, I like both. I actually have a sound canceling headphones that just create white noises just for thinking. I just get distracted sometimes with lyrics. So brainstorming, I'll listen to a lot of classical or a lot of OSTs from like films or games. But when um, I'm painting, then it's just I can listen to anything. I'm a little bit of like an omnivore with like music genres. Anything that can get me bopping. <laughs> I mean, mostly, I think the only thing I might have a hard time would be heavy metal. But aside from that, I'm pretty like, I'm not picky, <laughs> which might not be a good thing, but who knows? <laughs> okay. Um, you, you did mention this already, that you have mm -hmm. a little furry critter. That, ah, yes. um, <laughs> so does your furry critter um which you said was a cat um mm -hmm. hinder you or help you with your work oh of course both like uh, technically it would be hinder more but i like that distraction so i think that's why we have a cat but <laughs> actually he was our he was my model for tiny feet between the mountain because it's about a really big tiger and especially as like a fledgling artist who didn't know the anatomies of cat that well, that was my way to bond with my cat. He was at that time only one year old. So as a kid, oh. and I'll like study him and like sketch him as like, oh, he's like sits around. There's a curve like that. OK, perfect. You will be like that. He's actually at the end of the book for Tiny Feet Between the Mountains. I drew him very tiny at the end of the spread. So you can see a little cat looking at a rooster, which I probably can imagine how my cat looks at like those poor sparrows that like managed to sit next to our window. So <laughs> yes, honestly, inspiration and cuddly time and needed distraction. But of course, he like stepped in my ink well more than twice. So oh, no. that is always a... Uh, not a distraction that I like, but and he no, doesn't like I would it either. Think so. At least it's mutual. <laughs> I would imagine. It's I bet terrible. it took a long time to get the ink off of. I he was like, then he was trying to put his paw everywhere and wanted, of course, cats want to lick. So I was like holding his paw, but he had one paw on my chin, so I had a huge like a. Uh, cat uh, print on my chin <laughs> right on my cheek until after I cleaned him then I noticed it on the mirror I was like oh man okay <laughs> what a day oh wow he slept all day that day he was like I'm tired <laughs> me too <laughs> and I have a deadline <laughs> oh wow I can imagine you didn't get much done yeah no not that day <laughs> okay now I have two more questions for you yes, yes. where can people find your work aside from Annie's book Stop of Worcester um and mm -hmm. you have you can get uh, you can get Hannah's books um at Annie's if you call us at 508-796-5613 or you can order uh you can order uh, Hannah's books if you send us email at orders at annie'sbooksworcester.com and where else can people find your books? Well, definitely at um, bookstores, independent bookstores, like you mentioned. I'm a love bookshop.org. But then, of course, there's Amazon or just uh, online. But also, like, of course, there's like offline. But then if you want to look at more of my art or maybe a little bit more of like my social media presence, it would be hannahcha.com for my website. And then for my social media, I try, or actually all of them are all united by Hannah Unicha with the at symbol in front. So can you spell that? Oh, can you so H-A-N-N-A-Y-O-O-N-I-C-H-A. -N -N yeah. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And you just answered my next question. Which was how can oh, we follow perfect. your work? <laughs> which was uh, how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? Mm. So that was that was the answer to that one. <laughs> well, it was wonderful speaking with you, Hannah, and uh, thank you very much. And since you're in the area, you should drop by our our store. You're not oh, yeah, too definitely. far anyway. <laughs> yeah, I would need to make that trek, but I would love to. And thank you so much. These interview questions were so nice. 
I felt right at home. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> well, thanks again, Hannah Cha, uh, illustrator. Thank you. And uh, you can get the truth about dragons. Um, the Caldecott winner here. Uh, well, not winner, but honor. Honor winner. Yes. <laughs> honor winner. Oh. <laughs> and uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you.